Hey, happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to another installment of Veeam's LinkedIn live series, live stream, Industry Insights. Joined with me as always, Jason. Jason Buffington, how are you doing today? I am richly blessed, my friend. How are you? Good, good. I am very well. We've gone from last Sunday before last was six degrees. Yesterday was 56 degrees. So it's awesome. Really, really nice right now to be uh, wearing kind of more comfortable clothes again. But you know, one of the things that we want to do right off the bat is encourage any questions that people may have, because we do have a team monitoring that, but love to hear where you guys are from. I'm now in Boulder, Colorado. Jason's roughly outside of the Dallas, Texas area, both in the United States. Wherever you are in the world or whatever state you might be in, please just give a little shout out in the comments section, and we'll refer back to this global map, world map, a couple times throughout the, the episode here, and we'll see how much of the world we can actually get to turn green. So, Jason, you know, one of the things you and I both like to do working at Beam is obviously play with the product. And I kind of do it at more of a, a novice level, I'll say. But, you know, one of the things I always like to mention is the same instance of Beam that I run and pr predominantly back up to these little two terabyte SSD drives over USB-C here, and I just kind of rotate them, put one on the fire safe, one in the safety deposit box, and that kind of thing. But that same code, that same one instance of Veeam, I know of a customer in production protecting 20,000 virtual machines and eight petabytes of data. But, you know, the difference is being software defined, how you tune it in the infrastructure you put it on can make a difference. Now, I know you've got a little bit richer lab in Dallas that you also play with Veeam on. I do. I mean, I've got um, a couple uh, ESX hosts. I've got a Hyper-V host. I've got a very small NetApp. Um, thank you, NetApp, um, for that. Um, I've got, a, I don't know, probably 20 VMs running in different states. So yeah, so I've got a, a pretty decent amount of kit, and I'm running almost our entire portfolio uh, in Dallas. But one thing that kind of strikes me is um, when I first got started with VBR, uh, you know, with with my kind of setup, you know, I created a couple of VMs. I am running Sober for cloud, but it was next, 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 next finished, and within about 20 minutes, I was up and running. And so certainly for all the all the customers out there. Um, uh, point, uh, a proof of concepts with Veeam are always fun because really 20 minutes and all of a sudden when, whatever hardware you got laying around and I don't have really expensive hardware, I can be up and starting to experiment and, and understand what goes on in Veeam. Um, when you go past that though, when you really start talking about enterprise type architectures, you're right, it's the same software but that architecture has to look a whole lot different than than what I'm running here. And and for the folks at home, as you are putting in comments, you know, last week we had uh, Michael Cade on, and and uh, and the challenge uh, to all the folks at home was let's stump him on anything related to NetApp and storage. This week, if you have any questions around the nuances of a large, massive Fortune 500 grade enterprise backup solution, um, uh, we brought in someone smarter than the two of us collectively when it comes to backup architecture. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Smith. Tim, thanks for joining. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's, uh, so, Tim, you lead, uh, we consider you kind of like one of the hot shots on the solution architect team, but why don't you just tell folks, you know, a little bit about, you know, what you do other than uh, get to, you know, do presentations like this was proved to be incredibly valuable, by the way, at our Veeam on events, our Veeam live event that we just had, uh, independent webinars. We will flash up as we go through a couple times, probably a QR code where you can actually see a full, it's an hour plus presentation by Tim on the finer points of what he's going to go through. There we have it on screen now. If you take a shot of that, you will get a very rich, detailed webinar on exactly what Tim's going to go through. So this is like a teaser. This is an appetizer. But Tim, what, on a day-in, day-out basis, tell us a little bit about your role. Yeah, so, you know, the Solutions Architect team, we're, we're helping there in those pre-sales engagements to get everything sized up for your environment, right? We're there to help you succeed in the deployment of, of Veeam in your environment. So a lot of times we're going to get a lot of information gathering, um, you know, how many clusters you have, how many sites you have, all of that stuff. 
Uh, now, I'm a little bit more focused now on some of our emerging technologies. Uh, so I do a lot with Microsoft Office for uh, 365, now my M365, uh, our Nutanix AHV Veeam Availability Orchestrator, I'm heavily involved with. And uh, right now we're uh, with Kasten. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, Kubernetes stuff going on. So that's going to be a whole lot of fun. That's going to be something else that's going to be in my wheelhouse on the architecture team. And I'm excited for that. I got to tell you, I'm kind of envious of that, Tim. I mean, just 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 when just when you kind of mastered um, data center centric data protection and architecture, um, we basically threw you into everything that's not in the data center, um, <laughs> which, uh, you know, uh, Dave and I talk about the fact that each of us have a little over 30 years of data protection each um, in experience. And, and certainly the reason why we're still in backup. Um, three decades each um, uh, or longer is because the production environment of choice keeps changing, um, and uh, and and kudos to staying on the technical edge of all of those streams. I, I still can't get Kubernetes to install correctly. <laughs> for me. So so yeah so yeah tell us tell us more about it. So what does that take you through in, in your uh, in your week or your month? How do you, how do you apply that new learning? So, you know, I, what I really enjoy is, you know, customers are always coming with new things, right? Because they're adopting to these newer technologies and, you know, cloud first uh, initiatives within their environment. So, uh, you know, I get companies that have been in O365 since maybe the first year. And there's some that are, you know, they're like, we're still running X amount of uh, DAGs in our exchange environment and we're just starting to go. And uh, so it's really fun to see what they're learning along uh, in the process, you know, right with O365, there's no backups, and which is why we have backup for Office 365. Sure. And a lot of times it's very interesting to see um, the thought process of, well, do we need a backup? And then it's a whole conversation around, well, what are your policies? What are your requirements? And it just drives this whole conversation and gets everyone involved, which I really enjoy. Uh, and then we come to the conclusion that, you know, it, it is your data, and so it should be protected. And uh, you know now with Kubernetes, right? It's just it's applications in a different manner. It's no longer applications just on Windows servers. These monolithic beasts, they're they're elsewhere, but there's still data there that needs protected. And how are we going to do that? Yeah, that's one of the fun things about backup, right? Best practices really don't change. Infrastructure does, workload does. Maybe now where that workload resides changes or expands because we never really seem to get rid of anything for many of the big organizations, right? We just expand. But maybe take us through like VBR components and just kind of assume that some people may be hearing some of this for the first time. And obviously some people are going to have like a, a master's level understanding. <laughs> Yeah, so when we go into size, let's say for a VBR environment, there's a couple things that we look at. And so let's look at like the uh, main components, right? Uh, Veeam backup and replication. So we've got the backup server itself, which is, you know, the management device where the jobs are defined, where jobs are being run. We're saying this is what we're going to protect. Uh, that's backed by a SQL server, whether that's on the VBR server itself or an external SQL server. And we have our proxy servers, which are the data movers. These are responsible for grabbing the virtual machine data uh, and uh, sending it off to our backup repositories, number four, which is just our um, storage, right, for all of your backups. And then we have the enterprise manager, which is great for managing multiple backup servers, multiple sites, self-service restores. Uh, and then I like to talk about a combo server, which is essentially organizations that like to have a physical uh, server acting as that proxy, that data mover and repository, maybe with like local disks, right? You can get local servers with like 60 disks and a lot of CPU. So they're great because you can plug them into your storage network, get all of your backup traffic off of your regular network and across your storage and directly on your repositories on disk. So this is where we always start is, uh, you know, these main components in the environment. And now, that's kind of almost a little deceptive, right? Because, you know, when you first do a point of, a proof of concept with Veeam, you put the whole thing in one VM as a start, right? I create a VM, I go next, 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 finish, and all of a sudden it's just VBR. But that's absolutely. actually not true. Yeah, you know, and, and in the smallest environments, VBR sometimes is just that all one box. Mm -hmm. And uh, But yeah, in, in larger environments, we definitely want to scale out. 
because we can do that. We can scale out, we can scale up. And so it's nice to separate out these roles, uh, especially in multi-site scenarios, right? Because you can keep your backup server at your uh, DR site, uh, if you've got a DR and a, a live site, uh, but your proxies, your data movers, your repositories can sit at that production site. So maybe we're just managing it remotely. That way, if there's a whole site failure, you know, recovery from those copies at that remote site might be easier. One less step to do. All sorts of ideas on where we want to put things and how they want to interact with transferring the data, maybe across your network or across your fiber channel. Um, it's it's pretty fun. That's really interesting. You know, one of the things that Dave and I talked about a few weeks ago was the power of software defined. And when we look at, say, some of the appliance form factors that are trying to break into the market, the one of the biggest problems with most appliance architectures is, is that all the all all of the directions for growth are all bound to that that little to you for you box. It is hard to scale just one attribute of your architecture at a time. You have to scale the you scale compute and storage and network all at the same time, and then you find out you now have unused resources. Golly, why did you have to pay for that? This is really interesting. That as part of a software defined architecture, you can scale each of those permutations or those those uh, those levers or axes separately. Yeah, and you know, really, I think where the software defined really shines too is when we're talking about repository servers, right? Whatever hardware your company is already invested in. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, we talk about that appliance model, maybe you have virtual machines or uh, physical machines that need to be backed up to storage that uh, really helps with that low RTO, that quick recovery, but you have other things that don't need to. So you can have repositories that sit on SSD and repositories that go to uh, just these disks over here and for VMs that don't need fast recovery. And so you don't have to have everything going into a one-stop uh, storage solution when you can have multiple storage solutions to meet those individual workload needs. Yeah, that's a good comment. And and Marius uh, has a comment that's very much related to that, Tim. You know, the question was how to secure a server to not be infected by ransomware. And there's a couple angles there, meaning that could be a production server in which case, uh, Rick Vanover, our colleague in product strategy, he's done a number of go really good webinars, including LinkedIn live streams here about how to harden your servers and how appropriate it is to have different levels of password credentials, limit network access where you can, basically good hygiene, but make it very difficult or more challenging for bad actors to infiltrate. On the Veeam side, to your point, there are ways to harden the Veeam infrastructure not the least of which is where you write data, which still could include physical tape for air gapping, could include the ability to lock down an immutable copy of the data. But, you know, speaking of wherever you are in the world and whatever you might want to be doing to thwart ransomware, Jason, I think we've got an update on the map. Yeah, so 16 countries? Is that is that that's uh, uh, in only 12 minutes into our cast? That actually might be a new record for us. We would like to have more countries than minutes into the show. Um, <laughs> so what do we got? So we got uh, uh, we'll, we have the great state of Texas representing. Um, that's me, by the way. Uh, France, Czech Republic's in the house. Uh, UK, Iran, Hungary, Slovenia. Um, Slovenia almost always comes to these. Thank you for joining every week. Uh, Brazil, one of my favorite places to be a carnivore in. Italy, Morocco, Spain, Belgium, uh, Atlanta, uh, the um, Montana. We have to count them. Um, they're almost uh, country-like as far as their size goes. Colombia, Turkey, New Hampshire. Pretty sure that might be our boss. Um, Angola and Kazakhstan. Very cool. All right. And uh, and India is a uh, is a late man. We have more uh, of Europe green than not. And there's actually um, uh, you could use that in more than one context, not just the map. But yes, the Europe is turning green even as we speak. That is awesome. By the way, what we're not seeing, we should check next time uh, we do the map. Um, uh, my my favorite folks from South Africa have yet to uh, to join the roll call for this week. So. All right. So. So, Tim. 
we've got a lot of countries that are watching what you're saying, right? So you you talked about that architecture pieces. Let's kind of double click into that. When you sure. first sit down with an enterprise team, and I love how you said, you know, get more people in that conversation. When you start talking with that enterprise team, what are some of those questions or considerations that you ask that really start to drive how you're going to shape an enterprise architecture? Yeah, I you know, I always like to start with your RPOs and RTOs and hopefully they already have it defined um, because a lot of times, you know, it's uh, just best effort. And so it's nice to actually say, you know, like, let's let's sit down, let's define, let's work with your application teams and find out what we actually have to have these back up when uh, it when any sort of you know, problem or disaster arises. Uh, so it's number five on this list here. But in my opinion, it's number one, right? This is the the most important. You know, what are your RPOs? What are your RTOs, your recover point objectives, your recovery time objectives? How quickly do we need this backup and how much data can you actually lose during that time? But uh, when it comes to, you know, sizing for the environments, uh, yeah, the the standard, right? How much source data is in these virtual machines, physical machines? How many of them need to be protected? Uh, and a bonus, I always like to say, is the number of disks, too. So like in a virtual environment, if you have a virtual machine that has 15 virtual disks versus one that has one, there's a little couple different nuances on how that's going to be backed up as well. But uh, backup windows, uh, you know, Jason, I know you know that sometimes backup windows aren't a thing anymore. Um, snapshotting has changed so much in VMware's history uh, that applications now have no stun uh, typically with with snapshots anymore. So the need to actually do backups after hours sometimes is non-existent. So it's not a problem to take uh, backups or replicas of virtual machines, you know, every hour, even during the workday to get those much lower RPOs. Yeah. And related to that, we do have a question from um, Sengiz that came in about uh, replication and black level activity when what's our roadmap looking like we're actually in technical preview now and have been for some time in our continuous data protection and it maps into what you were saying Tim you know part of this is you have to ideally know it what is your real business requirements for the data and our belief is there's going to be some subset maybe it's 10 percent maybe it's 15 percent of your more transactional systems that can really benefit from continuous data protection so we've announced that for our version 11. We've previewed that not too long ago at Veeam Live. Jason, you may even have it in your lab. I got the chance to actually, from our Columbus lab, to play with it a little bit. It's hardened and it's coming soon in version 11. What I mean by soon is really just a couple of months. Yeah, I pulled down the beta, but um, uh, I don't have enough storage to do both. So I got to um, uh, rip out my VBR 10 and, and get some VBR 11 going in there. But yes, uh, I am so eager to actually put hands on those bits. Yeah, uh, it's, now, it's a lot now, of fun. Tim, I, I enjoy the CDP. Have you got a chance to, to play with the bits and, and you've got zeros and ones going by in real time? I do. I have zeros and ones going by in real time, and I, I love the uh, way that we're doing it too, right? Tying right into those vSphere APIs and also the way that we have our short and our long-term retention built right into that single job. So, you know, you can get that really short RPO, uh, but you can also keep those longer terms around uh, in the background as well. Uh, that way it's almost kind of like a GFS for CDP, if you will. We can oh, keep, yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm going to actually talk about that last week. We talked about how, um, you know, for most folks, uh, you mentioned backup windows earlier. For most folks, you were thinking about dailies and weeklies and monthlies. And when we started yeah. adding things like snapshotting and replication, you get down to, you know, daily uh, grandfather, father, son, and puppy. It's that next layer of granularity. <laughs> um, CDP just continues to shrink that um, down to zero. Um, certainly, it's it's been a feature that been have been uh, uh, folks have been coveting for a while. So you want to keep taking us through. So so how do you then take some of those questions and do we cover all five? And then let's make those actionable with uh, with what folks should be thinking about. Sure. The last one there uh, we didn't cover was number four, which is just the change rate. Um, a lot of times uh, we have some customers that just aren't aware of how much data is actually changing. So. You know, for those watching, five to ten percent is a really good uh, range uh, for most organizations, right? Ten percent is a conservative rate, um, 
Uh, but we'll need that change rate to determine, right, the size of the incremental backups. Um, but there's reports inside of our own product, right, Veeam 1. Uh, so a lot of times what we'll end up doing is getting Veeam 1 installed, let that run for a little while, and actually learn the change rate in the environments, which really helps us to plan ahead for repositories or for existing customers, right? You get Veeam 1 running in there, and you're going to know that growth and time on, and you're going to know when you might need to upgrade storage because of all the additional workloads you put in your environment. So after we have all of this information here, that's typically when we'd look at sizing, uh, moving the data, uh, which would be our proxies that I talked about. And I just briefly want to touch here, you know, in that webinar, we had the QR link for, uh, you know, we got the whole presentation. And I walk through exactly how this is sized, uh, but essentially it's uh, per virtual disk. And the of the two speeds there, 100 meg and 25 megabytes per second, this is just an average throughput of how quickly that data is processed with a full backup or an incremental. And when we're actually determining how much uh, compute our proxies need to process this amount of data, the calculation on screen simply says, if I have this much data and I have a backup window of this amount of time, how many cores of CPU do I need to get that data over to storage in that backup window? So for instance, uh, this is in the presentation as well with that QR code. Uh, we have 260 terabytes of data and I'm going by the 100 megabytes per second full backup rate to give me an estimate down at the bottom that I would need 95 cores, uh, whether that's physical or virtual proxies, and how much RAM would be needed to process that amount of data. But if we look at the incremental size, and we add a 10% change rate, that drops down to 38 cores. And so a lot of times I have customers ask, well, do I size for the full or the incremental? And nine times out of 10, you're gonna size towards the incremental because nobody's running a full backup every night. And even if you're doing active fulls, which is us going out and reading all the bits from the, from the source virtual machines, right? you're probably not going to schedule all those on the same night. You're probably going to want, you know, some on Monday, some on Tuesday, some on Wednesday. So it's going to be spread out throughout the week. And that way you're not wasting resources. Or if you're using synthetic fulls, uh, which is goes great with uh, our fast cloning capabilities and REFS and XFS file systems, you know, that synthetic full is just an incremental. So we're processing an incremental rate of data and just turning it into a full on the back end. So a lot of times this is what we'll look at first is how much data you have. Do you have a backup window, the change rate, so we can determine what we're going to need to move that data onto the repositories. You know, the way that you explained that, I think I now understand why our colleague Rick Vanover is such a fan of REFS um, yes. uh, be, uh, based on that last perk of, of how that would influence um, the synthetic foals versus um, actually having to do a real full over time. Dave, you don't miss those days of, you know, full backups every night just to make sure you had compliance and those were those were good times. It was brutal because talk about stressing the system, right? You're doing it on, on a regular basis. And oh, yeah. one thing that backup does really, really well is push everything in the infrastructure hard if you're going to do a full. And one of the things that I'm always really keen about Veeam is, again, I'll use the phrase, it's a forgiving product. You can install it quickly. You can get a result quickly. You don't have to get too steeped in size, at least initially, meaning a lot of infrastructure requirements can be easily satisfied by really just about any gear that you're looking to deploy the product on. What we're really talking about, though, is if you want to fine tune something, if you really want to get the maximum performance and or maximum scale, you know, here's some great tips. And we'll flash that QR code up again so people can double click on what I'll call basically a graduate level class in tuning your system. Here's someone that does this for a living, has been doing it for years and can save you a lot of time. And, you know, every time, I think I've heard you speak on this topic now four times, Tim, and I feel yeah. like I learned something every single time. You're probably saying the same thing every time, but every time I'm getting just a little bit more nuance out of it. You know, it's, a, it's an ever evolving presentation too, because, you know, when we did, introduced that REFS, the fast cloning. Well, I, I, now we got to add to that. And now with XFS and, uh, you know, now going out to object storage with our scale out backup repositories, uh, you know, that 
and now we even have a new mode there. So it's constantly evolving and changing the way that uh, I'm implementing customer environments too. Um, I'm, I'm going to go on here to the scale up backup repositories, right? So uh, if you don't have a scale up backup repository, it's essentially a collection of repositories. And that could be as small as one local repository and object storage. So in this case, we've added the ability, let me start here. Previously, we would move data off to object storage. Uh, so you'd back it up and we'd say after X amount of days, move it off to object storage. And you still have just the one copy. It's either local or off premises. Now we have the ability to do the copy, immediate copy off to object storage. So if you're targeting this scale out backup repository, and your backups land on disk now, they're immediately copied off to object storage. So now you're already following your 3-2-1 rule with your three copies of data, uh, and uh, one of those being off-site now in object storage. And you can have both of these there uh, turned on at the same time, which means since we added GFS in the primary backups as well, that you can do everything in a single backup job now. We can get that data off-site, we can say we'll keep copies in both, but after 14 days, only keep the copies in object storage, remove the copies from the local storage. And when we're moving data to object storage, we're only moving unique data. It's very similar to how we do our REFS, XFS block cloning. If that data is already up there, if those blocks are already up in object storage, we're not copying them up again. And we're not doing any synthetic operations up there because it's all just a matter of pointers to different objects. Uh, so it makes the uh, upload out to object storage very, very minimal every night because it's just that unique data. Yeah, I want to give a quick shout out. You said so many great things there. Um, in addition to how really awesome the scale out backup repository is, huge shout out to Veeam1 analytic information gathering tool. It always seems to indicate and tell you more about your environment. Mm -hmm. As we look ahead, want to give a shout out to something that we haven't mentioned really uh, thus far. I think you touched on initially, Tim, as one of your focus areas, and that is Beam Availability Orchestrator. Our colleagues, Rick Vanover and Melissa Palmer, this Friday are going to double click on disaster recovery preparation and a tool that we've got, Veeam Availability Orchestrator, that can really assist in that environment. Maybe we've got one quick reference on the map. We've got a couple of new countries that came in. <clears throat> See, we've got, I think, India since the last time. We definitely got a little bit of South America, Missouri, Miami, Florida, Houston. Look at that, I love this zoom in technology. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, very, very neat stuff there. Always appreciate everyone. I mean, these are just, Tim, the people watching live right now. We'll get at least a thousand and a half, two thousand people over and above right now watching in just a, the next few days, really. But Tim, as we begin to wind down, want to thank you for sharing your expertise. You know, Jason and I, we we dabble with the product. You deploy it at scale, and you know, our British colleagues sometimes say, you know, deploy it in anger, right? You use it in production, <laughs> real world environments. Now, I don't want to scare people off. This is not just a solution for a Fortune 500, and some of these best tips and practices can actually be beneficial in smaller environments as well, including having a scale-out backup repository. Just on my home system, I evacuated one SSD drive for another and was able to use Sober to do that very, very yeah. transparently. Yeah, well, thanks so much for mode. taking the time, Tim, and, and sharing your, your expertise. Appreciate. Really encourage people to double-click on that webinar. It's fantastic. And Jason, as always, been a pleasure. Everyone stay safe, stay positive, and we'll see you on the next live stream.